We have some breaking news this evening. Masks on planes and trains may be coming off. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Atkinson. Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later, we will have Dr. Aaron Yoder, Associate Professor in Environmental, Agricultural, and Occupational Health at UNMC. Now, Dr. Gold, as always, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And I know our viewers are looking forward to your updates and the opportunity to ask their questions here a bit later. Why don't you go ahead with your update this evening? Well, thank you, Janet. As always, it's a great pleasure to be with you this evening and, of course, with our audience. We very much look forward to your questions and comments a little bit later in the show. But let's dig right into the graphics because I do have a lot to share, particularly in response to some viewer questions that originated in last week's show and also during the week. When we look at the global cases, you see in spite of a secondary spike after uh, the original Omicron BA1 spike. Globally, the numbers appear to be coming down, but they're still quite high, just over 800,000 cases per day. But that's down 41 percent over a 14-day period. And if you look at our death rate, uh, you can see we're at about 2,800, 2,900 deaths in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, again, 27 percent down and just over uh, 6.197, almost uh, 6.2 million confirmed deaths, again, as, uh, as a significant uh, underestimate of the deaths. If we look at the world map, uh, you can see uh, that the hottest spots uh, from case generation uh, are still uh, in Western Europe, uh, parts of Australia, uh, parts of Japan uh, and the subcontinent. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the uptick that we've been seeing in South Africa. Uh, and in other parts of the world uh, as well. The United States uh, is unfortunately still seeing a bit of an uptick, uh, and we'll uh, unpack that in much more detail. But as you can see here, uh, we are up 39 percent in cases, confirmed cases, to just over 80 million confirmed cases thus far, 37,600 in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, hospitalization down a little bit, 7% down in the last 14-day period, uh, at just under 15,000 Americans hospitalized, just under 2,000 in critical care units, which is a good sign. And again, the death numbers uh, continue to fall. We're at just under a million confirmed deaths. It's not going to be long before we cross that threshold, but 511 in the last 24 hours. And again, uh, every one of those is tragic. But those numbers are much, much lower uh, than they were previously. Let's get into a bit more of that detail. When we look at the United States map, you can see there's an awful lot of white uh, and light uh, yellow consider, uh, in pending very low case numbers. However, uh, in parts of uh, Colorado, certain parts of Texas, uh, the western uh, borders of Alaska, but also in the mid-Atlantic and the northeastern part of our country, we're continuing to see fairly high case rates. When we break that down uh, into a little bit more detail, uh, you can see here uh, on the chart that we're nowhere near the height of the Delta peak or the Omicron peak, but what was a very steep fall off in case numbers has not only plateaued, but has actually started to tick up again in the United States, largely due to the BA2 subtype. Uh, as of uh, midnight last night, our nation was at about 11 cases per 100,000 per day. Uh, Vermont seems to be at the very top of that uh, at uh, three and a half times that number. But Washington, D.C., Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, roughly three times the United States uh, average. When we look at some of the smaller communities, our rural farming and ranching communities, you can see that in Terry, Texas, <clears throat> Candler, Georgia, Laurel, Kentucky, uh, Nome, Alaska, uh, numbers much, much higher than the U.S. average, demonstrating the fact that COVID is still very much a disease of small rural communities as much as it is of the disease of the large urban uh, metropolitan areas, and sometimes uh, even more devastating. 
As we said earlier, this is predominantly a BA2 subtype outbreak in the United States right now, uh, about one and a half to two times more contagious than the BA1 Omicron variant, and as much as 12 to 15 times more contagious uh, than the original variant that we first saw now almost two and a half years ago in the United States. <clears throat> if you look at the distribution of variants across the U.S., you can see that somewhere between 85 and 95 percent are represented by the BA2 subtype. <clears throat> if you look at that geographically, uh, you can see in the uh, Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Pacific Northwest, <clears throat> the southwestern regions, uh, much more of the BA2. In the central part of the United States, which has always lagged a little bit behind the coastal communities, you can see that it's about 75% BA2 subtype, uh, but uh, it is rapidly catching up. And of course, as we've said earlier, BA2 is uh, significantly more contagious, but does not appear to be more severe, certainly not in vaccinated uh, individuals. It still is quite severe in non-vaxxed. I thought I would share this graphic tonight, though, and just give you a, a look at what's going on currently in the southern horn of Africa. So just to get our audience uh, organized, in the magenta color, you're seeing over the last several months since November, the rise and fall of the Omicron BA1 subtype. In the blue bars, you're seeing the rise and slight fall of the BA2 subtype, and regrettably, <clears throat> what you're seeing in the yellow and in the orange at the far edge of this uh, graphic is the BA4 and the BA5 subtype, which we're still learning a bit about, but as they are displacing BA2 in this part of the world, also in certain areas of Western Europe, such as Africa, some of the Scandinavian countries, it appears to be outcompeting BA2, which means it is yet more contagious. What we know or don't know about vaccine breakthrough and what we don't or don't know about severity remains to be determined. <clears throat> but it's certainly on our radar and has been identified by the World Health Organization as a variant that we do need to keep an eye on, uh, particularly uh, in parts of the world such as here. Now, one of the questions that I was asked uh, during the week to elaborate on is a little bit more about the National Wastewater Surveillance System. And this is a graphic provided by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that shows that there are multiple communities across the United States, and I'll show you a map in just a minute, that are collecting wastewater <clears throat> that in their local public health and state laboratories are counting the number of viral particles, and they then submit that uh, to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who then publishes it uh, on a periodic basis. You know, if we look uh, at the map of the United States, each of these little dots actually represents a site that is contributing data. <clears throat> and every week, there are more small and large communities uh, that are doing this. But what you can see from this, in the overall percentage of sites, last week there were less than 20 sites that were seeing an uptick. Uh, this week, uh, we're seeing approximately 60% of the sites uh, in the United States, now seeing an uptick in viral particles uh, in the, of COVID viral particles uh, in the wastewater. This is an important chart because it shows that the number of viral particles in the wastewater correlate very closely uh, with the caseloads, again, demonstrating the importance of it as a early warning system, probably more accurate than testing due to the amount of home rapid testing. And this is a chart looking at reported caseloads across the United States by the CDC. And then in the dark blue line at the top, what's been happening over the last three weeks in terms of wastewater concentration of COVID-19 viral particles. So just as we're now starting to see an uptick, again, I said in the high 30s over the last uh, 14 days in reported cases, you can see this was predicted by wastewater analysis. So it's something we continue to keep a very close eye on. Now let's switch to hospitalizations. Hospitalizations are down, certainly from the Omicron peak, uh, well down in the intensive care unit numbers, but again appear to be plateauing. And in some parts of the country, uh, we're actually starting to see a reversal of that, 
particularly in the northeast and the mid-Atlantic part of the country, including our nation's capital. Uh, if we look at it by region, you can see in the U.S. Uh, we're at four per 100,000 or just under 15,000 hospitalizations. However, Delaware is 13 per 100,000. Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, two and a half times that. North Carolina, Maine, New York, et cetera. Again, mimicking the map of case spread, as has always been the case since the very beginning of the pandemic. But if you look across the nation, including our communities uh, here in Nebraska, uh, certainly uh, in many, many other of our urban and rural communities, hospitalization loads are well down due to the very rapid fall of the Omicron uh, BA1 uh, subtypes. But what hospitals are seeing, and I just wanted to make these points because I think they're critically uh, relevant. This is a look at blood disorders, which include clotting in your legs, known as deep vein thrombosis or DVT, pulmonary embolism, uh, or, uh, or a combination of pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis. And in individuals that are 30 days or more out, and this was a very large study recently published, there's a 4.98-fold increase uh, in the chance of having blood clots in your legs as a late COVID complication, a 33 times higher incidence of having a blood clot in your lung. And this is based on a study of just under 5 million people, 4.967 million people. And so this is a very highly relevant study. Uh, and that is actually filling hospital beds as well, because in many instances, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism fill hospital beds. In addition to that, another thing that fills hospital beds is new onset of diabetes, people that are not aware of it. And indeed, again, what we're seeing with long COVID is a pronounced increase incidence of diabetes. And this shows the diagnosis of diabetes, the need for oral uh, hypoglycemics, oral medication for diabetes is up several fold in individuals that were in the first 12 months following their COVID infections. And indeed, uh, that appears to be the trend across the United States. And of course, given the total number of cases uh, and this in, uh, incredible uh, significance of diabetes as a chronic condition, uh, you know, we're quite concerned about this. What it shows, though, in this last slide on this subject is that if you're diagnosed with diabetes but don't need medication, <clears throat> uh, that's more commonly associated uh, with people that have COVID but never need to be hospitalized. If you're hospitalized, your chance of getting that diagnosis goes up significantly. And if you need intensive care, uh, your diagnosis of not only getting uh, di a diagnosis of diabetes but a diagnosis of diabetes that requires either insulin or requires oral medication goes up appreciably as well. Again, no surprise, but it's confirmatory of the fact that the more severe the infection is, the higher the likelihood is of comorbidity, of long COVID, and blood clots and diabetes are now a major part of long COVID. Uh, I also wanted to make a comment about hospitalization in response to a question that we had last week. The audience may recall that one of our callers uh, asked whether or not hospitals were incrementally paid for individuals if they died from COVID, and therefore was there an incentive to uh, identify deaths uh, as, a, as related to COVID. The answer to the question is absolutely not. There's never been, uh, and there is not currently, a consideration for that. However, <clears throat> there is an increment of pay that has occurred uh, due to the federal government, as long as there's an emergency state due to the pandemic, that pays for individuals who are hospitalized with COVID, uh, who need critical care, or who uh, are discharged uh, with COVID, an increment in what the federal government pays, that is to say, Medicare. Now, that has not been reflected for most or any of the private payers, to the best of our knowledge, and it's not been reflected in Medicaid payments. So I actually dug a little deeper into that question. And what I learned, actually, is that in spite of that increment, uh, at least in our medical center, we lose somewhere between $3,000 and $10,000 for every patient uh, diagnosed with COVID, uh, whether they survive or don't survive. 
So from a pure business perspective, uh, no motivation to uh, look for COVID patients. Uh, and indeed, again, in answer to our viewer from last week, uh, no way that uh, individuals who are coded as death due to COVID have an incremental payment. Moving on, though, uh, to talk about where we are in the deaths, you can see our overall death rate in the United States uh, is down, as tragically as that may be, to 511 over the last 24 hours, 0.15 per 100,000. <clears> but Nevada, Maine, Kentucky, uh, Oregon, Alabama are still significantly above that. That probably represents the case reporting being batched over the last uh, uh, 14 days. I also uh, was recently asked, well, you know, what is the COVID death rate compared to heart disease? What is it compared to cancer? How about accidents, including motorcycle and vehicular accidents, etc.? And I found this graphic that I thought would answer the question, going back to March of 2020, taking us through January of 2022. And what you see in the dark orange line is the death rate uh, per day, uh, you know, in the peak uh, of la January of 21, exceeding 3,000, 3,500 deaths per day. And you see where we are now, uh, you know, through January of 2022. So what you see, it's very variable. Uh, it's always over accident, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and other diagnoses. Uh, it's, for the most part, uh, more than cancer. And for some part of the time, it approaches the number one killer in the United States, uh, which is heart disease. And so if you were to look at the total area under that curve, you know, it, it is just a tragic amount of loss of life. Uh, rapidly, as I said earlier in the show, approaching a million confirmed deaths uh, due to COVID. So why don't we stop at this point? We'll talk about vaccines a little bit later. And I very much look forward, Janet, to your questions and, of course, uh, questions from our audience. Well, as always, Dr. Gold, certainly a lot of good information there. And I want to circle back to some of that here later. But starting things off, as we mentioned here at the top of the show, this afternoon a federal judge in Florida ruled the Biden administration can't require masks on planes or tra uh, public transportation. That was one of the last places that was still requiring them. But then just into our newsroom moments ago, airlines and train companies, uh, they won't be able to require them, but they are still encouraging mask wearing for those folks riding along. Um, and it's going to be strongly encouraged. So what have you heard about this? What are your thoughts? Well, certainly I've read the breaking news. Um, what I'm not aware of is what position uh, the federal courts uh, will have if, if there's a potential for appeal, and indeed whether, if not, the Centers for Disease Control or other uh, federal departments and agencies may have opinions, advice, et cetera. I guess uh, what I would say, Janet, is, is pretty simple, uh, that whether or not there's a mandate in these very closed containers and indeed, you know, I have flown quite a bit during the pandemic, you know, as I've shared with our audience, I am fully up to date in my vaccines. Uh, I like to believe I'm otherwise healthy and not terribly at high risk, uh, but I wear my mask. And frankly, given what's going on with the BA2 subtype rapidly spreading across the United States uh, and increasing with some increasing evidence of hospitalization, Given what's going on with the BA3, 4, and 5 subtypes in other parts of the world, you know, to me, uh, I, I a, would never want to think that I caused somebody to get ill, uh, nor would I ever want to run the incremental risk of doing it. You know, as, as our audience may know, you know, I've been a practicing surgeon for 25 years of my life, uh, trained as a cardiac surgeon in the Harvard system, and practiced for two and a half decades. So I'd go to the operating room, you know, several days a week and wear my mask for 12, 14, sometimes 18 hours uh, in a busy day. And guess what? I never thought twice about it. It seemed to be a very safe and reasonable thing to do to protect our patients and to be sure that they had the very best outcome. So, you know, I think common sense has to prevail. And, uh, you know, the, the issue to some extent is if you're going to get on an airplane or a train or a bus, uh, you just don't know 
whether the person sitting next to you, in front of you, behind you is vaccinated or not. You don't know whether the school kids uh, that are on that carrier uh, have been vaccinated and what's going on in their school system, particularly, you know, in the holiday cycle that we just went through, upcoming graduations and other school events. So I would say the jury is out a bit, to use an overly uh, legalistic term in terms of what this is going to actually mean in terms of appeals, judicial action. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, I'm not giving up my mask just yet. I think it's a small price to pay for a large amount of safety. On that note, Dr. Gold, under the new guidelines today, zero countries remain on the CDC's do not travel list. Uh, folks may be a bit curious as to when you'll feel safe traveling internationally again. So we have individuals on our faculty and staff that are traveling all over the world. We just had a team come back from Czechoslovakia. We have people that are heading to the Orient. As a matter of fact, we're planning some relief and some educational uh, components uh, to support uh, the, uh, what's going on in the Eastern Europe, Ukrainian uh, sector, uh, as well as Western Europe, South America, uh, parts of Africa, et cetera. We have research programs all over the world. Uh, and, and we have been uh, slowly but surely permitting uh, those uh, faculty members, staff, and to some extent students uh, to travel uh, on behalf uh, of the university. You know, again, uh, I think it's a matter of common sense. You look at what part of the world you're going to. You look, you have to understand your own vaccine status, your own medical comorbidities and risk. And frankly, think long and hard. <clears throat> if you're coming back to a family member who's immunocompromised, you know, has diabetes, is being treated for cancer, or has had an organ transplant, you know, you may want to think twice about it. If you're otherwise healthy and none of those risk factors exist, uh, you know, maybe it's a safe thing for an individual to do. You know, uh, I, I've always had a, what I believe to be a common sense approach to this. And while the regulations uh, sometimes provide guidance, Ultimately, uh, the common sense advice from our healthcare professionals uh, has to uh, be the, the single guiding factor. You know, and for our audience, you know, if we have audience members who either have medical conditions or are considering a certain part of the world uh, that they may want to visit for business reasons or personal reasons or family reasons, uh, you know, my best advice is reach out to your healthcare professional. If they don't know the answer, they probably know of somebody, uh, either in one of the local universities, one of their hospital systems, et cetera, who focuses on travel safety. They, knows, uh, you know, they know that if you're going to go to certain parts of Africa, you need yellow fever vaccine in order to get a visa. Well, maybe you need a different type of vaccination uh, for this as well. Well, Dr. Gold, we're going to head to break, but before we do, we're going to open our phone lines. That phone number to call is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. And when we come back, Dr. Aaron Yoder, Associate Professor in Environmental, Agricultural, and Occupational Health at UNMC, will join the conversation. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Atkinson, and once again joined by Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And we also now welcome Dr. Aaron Yoder. He's an associate professor in environment, agricultural, and occupational health at UNMC College of Public Health. Dr. Yoder is a graduate of Purdue University. His research focuses on technologies that lead to a safer and healthier work environment for people in agriculture and related industries. And he also grew up on a small farm in central Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And Dr. Yoder, thank you for sitting down with us here this evening. Uh, we'll get, of course, to general farm safety here in just a minute, but is the pandemic still affecting our farmers and ranchers from your perspective? Do we need to still take some protective measures on the farm? Yeah, those are great questions. I think just as we see in any industry out there, uh, labor is a, is a hot commodity and is something that's very um, very focused on right now. So we need to uh, make sure we have that safe labor force. And COVID's one thing that has changed the labor force a lot with shortage of labor and protecting the labor that we do have. So we do see lots of implications there, like I said, with labor, also with supplies in the supply chain and how that affects the agricultural operation. So all that can lead to extra, extra stress 
related to that. So we, we do see some impacts as we go across the state, across different commodity groups and um, across different parts of the country. Now, we know that agriculture can be one of our more dangerous workplaces. What made you want to take on ag safety as a profession? Yeah, it was when I was an undergraduate at actually Penn State University. Um, I worked underneath and worked with a uh, agricultural safety and health specialist in the agricultural engineering department. And he sort of took me under his wing and gave me opportunities to study it further to get out in the communities and do outreach, and that's the part of it that really drew me into it, was to be able to get out in the communities with the extension service and provide information uh, that would help protect farmers and their workers. Well, as we mentioned, the phone lines are open, 877-731-6733, and we have Eugene from Ohio on the line with us. Eugene, why don't you go, you go ahead with your question or comment? Yes, for Dr. Gold, it seems that we know that COVID-19 infects us because it replicates in the cell wall of the nasal cavity. That's why we get infected, because it replicates in the cell wall of the nasal cavity. I'm wondering why the government hasn't approved any nasal product for us to use to stop from getting infected by the replication of the, of the COVID in our cell wall of our nasal cavity. This far into the pandemic, it would seem to me that the government should have approved some sort of nasal spray that we could use to stop from getting infected in the first place. Thank you. Well, thanks for calling, Eugene, and I appreciate your very good question. To the best of my knowledge, uh, and I can do a little bit more research and get back to you on the show next week, but to the best of my knowledge, there's at least one and maybe more than one, not only vaccine, but uh, antiviral that are currently under investigation in the United States and in other parts of the world uh, that may be very useful for exactly what you're saying. Unfortunately, as the various uh, types of COVID have evolved, each of the variants of concern, particularly now with Omicron variant, it is less a nasal uh, type of infection and much more what we call an oropharyngeal type of infection, meaning the back of your throat, your airways, etc. Furthermore, the virus, when you inhale it, can actually get into your lung tissue and replicate quite quickly in your lung tissue. In one of our previous shows, we actually looked at some of the CT scans and the MRI scans of individuals uh, that had COVID uh, way back when, meaning months or years earlier, and saw a very significant incidence of scarring due to that. Now, to your point, that infection might have started in the nose uh, and then spread down the throat and into the airways. But right now, we're seeing less nasal congestion, less what I would characterize as a typical set of sinus-like symptoms early on, but fever, sore throat, scratchy throat, uh, shortness of breath, which then leads to the deeper lung infection, particularly those uh, that are not vaxxed. So whether a good nasal vaccine, uh, certainly most uh, folks, particularly young children, would much prefer a little spray in their nose than they'd prefer getting poked in the arm, certainly twice. Uh, and so all of those are, are very important ideas. Thanks for calling. Thank you, Eugene from Ohio, for that question. With that, we go to Illinois, and we have Nancy on the line with us. Nancy, go ahead. Yes, uh, I took the first two shots, Pfizer, and uh, I haven't had a booster. So now that the second booster has come out, is there a difference when I go to get the booster? Should I get, do I have a choice, or are the boosters both the same? It's been a year since I've had the last shot. So uh, two parts to your question, Nancy, if I may, and thank you so much for calling. Uh, one is that the vaccines themselves are the same. Uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J &J, uh, Janssen vaccine products sold in the United States, uh, manufactured here, are the same. However, based upon an extensive study uh, done and reported uh, a ways back called the mix and match trial, uh, we looked at 
scientific community uh, looked at antibody levels, meaning how actively your body responded if you got a boost from the same uh, anti- you know, v- uh, vaccine that you received early on. So if you started out with Pfizer, if you got a Pfizer boost compared to a J&J boost, compared to a Moderna boost, or other combinations, and you might imagine there are multiple different combinations. And it actually turns out that if you, if you mix and don't match, that is to say, if you got Pfizer and you're boosted with Moderna, if you got J&J and you're boosted with Pfizer, or some other combination, you're likely to make a larger amount of antibodies, and those antibodies are likely to, add, to last a bit longer. So uh, my best advice uh, would be to go ahead and get your boost, and if available, uh, it would be a good idea to mix. Now, the one way to find out is depending upon where you get your vaccine, you can just call your local pharmacies and ask what they have on a given day. All of the vaccines are pretty widely available in the United States right now. However, if, uh, as you said, you got two doses of Pfizer early on, if that's all that's available in your community, it's certainly worthwhile to get a boost with another dose of Pfizer because given what's going on with the BA2 subtype and these other variants that we're now seeing, uh, this would be a good time to get that boost, assuming that you're eligible based on the dates and you're eligible based on your age. And Nancy from Illinois, thank you for that call. Now, let's circle back to Dr. Yoder and bring you back into the conversation. Again, talking about agricultural safety. We've had you on RFD TV previously, and you talked about tractor safety courses. Tell us why these are needed and how this helps young people maybe become even interested in farming as a future career. Sure, we see it as a workforce development opportunity. So we know there's a lot of youth out there that are looking for jobs in the summertime, um, and we want them to make sure that they're doing those jobs safely. I know OSHA and a few other organizations are emphasizing youth work safety this month, um, and there's some great materials out there to do that. Agriculture is oftentimes a little bit different than other industries. It allows workers to do a little bit more hazardous tasks sometimes at a younger age. So through these training programs that we do as soon as school's out, before the youth head out into the workforce, um, we teach them some of the basic hazard recognition skills, some of the things to watch out for. Uh, a big part of that's also uh, communicating well with your supervisors, don't being afraid to ask questions, uh, not pretending that you know everything. So preparing them to do, do well in the workforce and stay safe and healthy in the workforce. Now, of course, we mentioned tractors, but we're not just talking about tractors. Anytime that we're using some big machinery, a small mistake or malfunction can certainly become a a big deal, a big problem in a hurry. Uh, Any thoughts on maybe a couple tips to keep in mind, whether you are teaching a young person or just operating this equipment yourself? Yeah, we oftentimes will talk about being prepared for any situation. We don't always know what's going to be going on, uh, but... We, can, we have a pretty good idea of what could potentially happen. So being prepared, um, thinking about our situations as we go into them, um, not just taking on the task full bore, thinking about what could go wrong and how to prevent that from happening. Um, we see structures like grain bins and other machinery. Uh, grain bins have been getting larger and have more opportunities for injuries. Um, animal handling is one that doesn't get talked about as much as sometimes the machinery safety. Uh, but being safe around the animals, they're a little more unpredictable than the machinery itself. So um, we have lots of opportunities to think about what's going on. Take 20, 30 seconds before you do a task just to think about how you want to do it and what's the safest way to do it. Well, thank you, Dr. Yoder. Uh, Dr. Gold, I want to circle back around to a conversation or some points that you made here in our first part of the show, talking about some of the after effects for folks that have had COVID. I know we have a lot of viewers that have been through it. Uh, You mentioned deep vein thrombosis, also embolism, as well as maybe uh, development of diabetes, whether short term or long term. What are maybe some of the the symptoms that folks need to look out for if they are now post COVID and just trying to keep an eye on their health even more so? You know, Janet, the most common things that we see in our long COVID uh, clinics are people complaining of fatigue and what has been affectionately called brain fog. That is to say, they used to be really sharp and now they can barely remember somebody's name or a phone number or their cell phone or something along those lines. But we're also seeing a a lot of uh, shortness of breath, 
people that used to be quite athletic and that had good exercise tolerance, they could run up several flights of stairs, and now getting out of bed or running up a couple of steps uh, in their living room has become uh, something that causes them to lose their breath and accelerate their heart rate. We talked a little bit earlier in the show about the incidence of blood clotting in veins and in small arteries. Uh, we've heard a lot about myocarditis and uh, pericarditis, uh, which sometimes accompanies long COVID. And so we're seeing a, a wide mix of, uh, of symptoms. And interestingly, uh, in, in young people as well as in older people, uh, the data does show that the more severe your case of COVID is, the higher your likelihood is of diabetes, of stroke, of severe heart disease, uh, et cetera. But even if you've had a very mild or sometimes uh, asymptomatic case, no symptoms at all, you know, we've seen that in high school kids and, and younger uh, uh, students who have, uh, you know, been diagnosed with COVID based on a, either a rapid test or a PCR, but, you know, never really had much of a symptom at all never spiked a fever, maybe a mildly scratchy throat, et cetera. You know, <clears throat> three weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, they are coming back with some of these long COVID symptoms. And the sad part about it is, is uh, there are no clear remedies to these. You know, uh, for those that have not been vaxxed, getting vaccinated does seem to be effective in some of them. So there's clearly an immunologic component to it. But for those that have been fully vaxxed, uh, other than treating the symptom, meaning if they have heart failure, we treat the heart failure. Uh, if they have blood clots, we give them blood thinners and things along those lines. If they lose control of the ability to manage their glucose levels, uh, meaning they become diabetic, we, of course, have good medication for that. But we're not really treating the root cause. We're treating the symptom. So until we learn more about the root cause, uh, we're going to be treating these symptoms. And I believe we're going to be treating these symptoms for a very long time to come. All right. Well, with that, let's go to the phone line. We have Annie from Delaware on the line with us. Annie, go ahead with your question or comment. Hi, good evening. This is Annie from Wilmington, Delaware. I want to thank you for taking the time today uh, to be on the show. Uh, my question is a good one. I'd like to know what are they recommending to people who have had a reaction to a vaccine um, let's say a reaction to Pfizer, a severe one regarding their heart. Um, and another person told me that what they recommended was if you had a reaction to one vaccine, a Pfizer, then you should try to take a different one, which um, that people aren't feeling safe about that if you've had a severe reaction. Um, so, and I wanted to know what the treatment was recommended for those folks that have had a serious reaction who don't feel comfortable to get a vaccine. Thank you. Well, Annie, thank you so much for calling and thanks for asking uh, I, what I agree to be a very important question. Uh, first of all, the incidence of serious reactions is extremely small. The usual, more common reactions are soreness of your arm, perhaps some headache, maybe a day or day and a half of low-grade fever, but usually that's the limit of the reactions. But there is a very small number. We're talking single digits per million of vaccines. And don't forget, uh, we've administered hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine uh, for COVID-19 in the United States, uh, very small numbers of serious reactions but they do occur. And if you've had a serious reaction, the most important thing is to contact your healthcare professional, possibly an infectious disease specialist or an allergist, to talk through whether or not you should get another dose of vaccine or run your chances of getting COVID and one of the complications of it, whether you should be pre-treated with a medication before you get another dose, and if so, whether you should get the same vaccine, a different vaccine, the same dose, or more likely a lower dose of the vaccine. Another important consideration is if you've had a previous reaction, uh, particularly if it's a serious reaction, you probably want to get that done in a place where there's skilled healthcare professionals around you in event you have another reaction. Most of the really serious reactions, what we call the anaphylactic reactions, 
to any drug or any vaccine or for that matter, pollens, foods, you know, people that have severe peanut allergies, for instance, uh, those occur in a matter of minutes or certainly uh, in the first half hour or 45 minutes. And so if that's you or, or some one of our other viewers, you probably want to get that dose in a place that you're being monitored and people are carefully watching you to be sure before you go home that nothing uh, is averse. But again, these are decisions uh, that have to be made on an individual basis uh, by individual healthcare professionals uh, and our patients. So thanks for calling and thanks for that really, really important question. Thank you for that call, Annie. Now, again, the phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. With that, more Rural Health Matters coming back after this. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Dr. Aaron Yoder, Associate Professor in Environmental, Agricultural, and Occupational Health at UNMC. Gentlemen, as always, thank you very much for joining us. Again, our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. And we have Charles on the line with us from California. Charles, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Yes, my question is, a lot of my workers work in the inner city, and myself also, and we're seeing a lot of illegal aliens being dumped off on, uh, re dumped off on white buses on our streets. And my question is, how can we protect ourselves from, from them? We don't know who they are, and they, most of them are not wearing masks, and they do come into our office and things and business and the stores and where I send my workers, and according to the government, there's 10 million of them wandering around in our country, and they have not been vaccinated or tested or anything. They're just just dropped off, and for other diseases, too. And I think it's becoming quite a problem because I was notified today that one of my workers was tested positive, and he would be wandering in these areas, too, working. And, of course, he went home. What can we do as a citizen to protect us from the 10 million that are wandering in our streets that have never been tested, who are from other countries, and have never been vaccinated? That's a lot of people. Dr. Gold? Sure. Well, Charles, first of all, thank you for calling and sharing your concerns. You know, I think whether these are individuals that are, quote, being dropped off or whether these are people that are just, uh, you know, through a place of business, given what we've been seeing now in these very highly transmissible variants, we know that people that are unmasked, people that are uh, eating, drinking, even speaking, we've, you know, seen all the data on choir practices and things of that nature, uh, that these virus particles are spread quite easily. And so we know that the non-pharmacologic interventions and the pharmacologic interventions are very effective. So social distancing for your, you and your staff to use your mask, particularly a good fitting uh, mask that covers your nose and mouth, uh, to be sure that you sanitize surfaces and your hands uh, at reasonably uh, good intervals. And of course, for you and for your staff, to be sure you're fully up to date on your vaccines, uh, which now with a second boost available will just give you an added benefit <clears throat> to protect yourself and to protect your staff. Uh, I think that we're going to be going through this for some time to come in the future. We're likely going to be see increases in caseload uh, due to these highly transmissible Omicron subtypes that are now being diagnosed in Africa and in Europe, in addition to the ones we're seeing uh, in our country. And so we've got to do what's practical and uh, things that we know work. The other thing that I would say is your, your staff member who went home, uh, who tested positive, made exactly the right decision. If somebody, either you or heaven forbid, a staff member or a family member has symptoms, you know, stay home, get tested, get a rapid test or go to your local clinic or pharmacy. If you test positive, notify people that you've been with and get a hold of one of these new oral agents, uh, this monopiravir or Paxlovid, which are the two widely used oral agents now, incredibly effective. You know, I've known folks that are, are personal friends of mine 
who are really sick, you know, almost sick enough to get hospitalized, but not quite, got one of these prescriptions, and within a day or so, one of them called me and said, you know, Jeff, uh, I feel like I could run the marathon. Uh, you know, I don't know if he or she felt quite that good. Hopefully they didn't, because they probably weren't totally cured of the virus by that point. But you get my idea <clears throat> that these oral drugs are very effective. So we now have tools in the tool chest to prevent and to fight the spread of this disease. We just have to know how to use them. And thank you, Charles, out of California for his question. Dr. Yoder, on that note, of course, talking about employing people, we have to look out for their safety and the environment that they work in. How is UNMC and what you do helping ag employers create safer working conditions? <clears throat> Some of the best stuff we can do is like this television show is to educate people uh, about those protective measures that we can do. Fortunately, in agriculture, we don't have as many close quarters as a lot of other jobs and businesses, just like the previous question, or in, in towns and cities. We do occasionally have that in break rooms or other types of tasks we might be doing in a group. Um, so educating them about how to protect themselves, how to stay distance from each other, continuing that hand sanitation, um, and some of those good practices which help the prevent of other diseases, too, that we see in agriculture, especially when we're working with animals, uh, the zoonotic diseases and that sort of thing. So um, the education, I think, is one of the biggest things, but getting out there and demonstrating it, offering opportunities to do training, uh, like we mentioned, the tractor safety training earlier, uh, we include all of that in those training programs now. And on that note, what about the agricultural work environments that environments that might require a bit of special training. Uh, for example, of course, grain bin safety and feed yard training, those certainly do come up a lot. We hear a lot about grain bin hazards. Yeah, we were fortunate enough last week to do a stand up for grain safety program um, out at one of our research farms just outside of Omaha. So there's some great resources and we collaborate with others. But, you know, everything from we obviously in public health, we try to prevent injuries from happening. But also we need to train first responders and even farm families when they see an incident, how to respond to that. So some of the specialized training of tools that we need to use to prevent injuries and the new modern equipment, as well as some of the extraction tools we use and other things when we do uh, stumble upon someone that has had an injury, um, especially in some of the larger equipment that requires some specialized training and tools. Well, with that, let's also go back to the phone lines now. We have Pharaoh from Tennessee on the line with us. Pharaoh, go ahead with your question or comment. Yes, I've had all three of my shots over a year ago, and I wonder if it would be beneficial for me to have a booster each year. Well, Pharaoh, again, thank you for calling. Good question again. Uh, so if it was over a year ago, and the, the, well, the boosts were mostly FDA approved. Uh, I, my recollection is late August or early uh, September, depending upon whether you have multiple other medical conditions or not, or just based on your age. But, you know, with the current uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommendations, uh, I would say the plan would be a good thing to talk to your local health care professional and if you're of age or if you've got any of the medical conditions that would raise your risk, I'd certainly recommend getting a boost. And again, as our, one of our earlier callers asked, you know, if you've previously had uh, one vaccine, you know, think about where you could go to get one of the others. Uh, because the mix and match trial is pretty conclusive that when you mix up the different types of vaccines, you get higher antibody levels and you get longer lasting immunity. Now, what you're really asking me, Farrell, is whether or not that's going to result in an annual immunization. And uh, the jury's out on that question. We really don't know. But it's probably going to be at least for a while until we start to put some of these uh, variant spikes behind us. So I'd plan to get another boost and then see where we are, you know, 3, 6, 12 months from now. By that time, we'll have more data on antibody levels, reinfection levels, variants, uh, et cetera. Hopefully, there are vaccines that are under development now, which will be far less specific to a single variant. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when the uh, Pfizer, the Moderna, and the J&J &J vaccines, as well as many others, were developed, 
they were developed to the early strain of uh, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we first saw introduced in January of 2020 in the United States. January 23rd, I believe, was the first confirmed hospitalization uh, in the United States. And uh, since that time, of course, we've seen many different subtypes and variants. So every time there's another variant, uh, it's slightly less uh, vaccine effective, slightly higher risk of reinfection, because that's how these viruses survive. They beat, they trick our immune systems, they beat our vaccines, uh, and they beat our ability to uh, defend ourselves against them. And Pharaoh, thank you for that call. Dr. Yoder, I'd like to circle back to you as we start to wind down the clock here on our hour. Uh, we've been talking about agricultural safety right now, spring planting season. We've all been out on the road and encountered farmers moving machinery. It is that time of year where there's big equipment moving out and about. What are some things that we as farmers driving this equipment and also consumers, drivers on the road uh, working around this equipment, what do we all need to keep in mind to make sure it's safe for everyone? That's a great question. It really is everybody's responsibility, just like uh, COVID and everything else we've been talking about. But remembering to take our patients with us, we, we try to encourage that with people just like every day when we go driving. Unfortunately, we're also seeing construction season starting too. So it can be a combination of the two. Uh, but making sure that uh, as producers that we're visible out there, that we light and mark our equipment well, that we signal you know, if we can have beacons, slow-moving vehicle signs, and that sort of thing. Um, as motorists that are driving around this equipment, um, not rushing to get around them, if we do have the opportunity to pass, to make sure that we're doing it safely and in the right zones. Um, but following a, a tractor for even a mile or two doesn't take much more time than if you were stopped at a red light uh, for one cycle. So keep that in the back of your mind and, and have your patience, both the, the operators of the equipment um, as well as the motorists that are operating around them. I like what you said there. Take our patients with us. That's something that I could take to myself, just driving through Nashville traffic without a doubt. Now, any last thoughts, Dr. Yoder, that you'd like to share? <clears throat> yeah, there are a few things we mentioned earlier, sort of the stress um, that we see now and potentially some behavioral health um, issues that we might see coming up. We have been encouraged to see that um, agricultural producers, farmers, and the farming communities have really started chatting with each other. I just saw one of our graduate student presentations today about how uh, we rely on our communities and our neighbors in times like this. So to continue to remember that as we're out there, if we have stresses, to talk those over with other people, uh, to seek help if we do need it. Uh, but I think uh, we're seeing a lot of a good rebounding happening in the agricultural communities, and we'd like to see that continue. And Dr. Gold, any last thoughts for you as well? Absolutely. You know, there was just recently a report that there are just over 200,000 children in the United States that have lost one or both parents thus far uh, due to COVID. So when we talk about the long-term effects of COVID, particularly the mental health impact of COVID, just think about that for a minute. 200,000 children. Uh, have lost one or both of their parents. And certainly our thoughts and our prayers are with them. And this is going to be a long-term challenge for us to support. Uh, so when we talk about taking precautions, using common sense, uh, getting our vaccines and our masks, we should think about that as well. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you again. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Dr. Yo Dr. Yoder joining us both. And of course, if we didn't get to your question tonight, leave us a call on our voice recording.